All right. Uh, hi, everybody. It's so excited to be back and with Justin. So, Justin, why don't you introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Justin. I am uh, working on Istio for Google. I've been working on it for about three years. Um, most of the work I've been doing for the last couple has been sort of in preparation for this ambient work. Uh, prior to that, I used to work on a project called Open vSwitch and the OVN, so it's a little bit more in the SDN world uh, than the service mesh. So been enjoying what I've been seeing so far, though. Awesome. Yeah, I'm so excited because Justin and I have been working on Istio Ambient Service Mesh for at least six months. And also even before that, in the Istio community, uh, Justin, I believe you presented some idea to the Istio Networking Workgroup. So that was over a year ago. So it's really cool to be together with Justin. I think some of you know me from early on, but just real quickly, I work for Solo. I'm one of the founding members of the Istio community sits on the technical oversight and steering committee. And most exciting about me is Istio Ambient. I actually wrote a book about Istio Ambient, explain with Christian. So if you guys ask a really good question for our session, you're gonna get one of our books. All right, I'd like to start talking about challenges with sidecars today. Uh, the biggest challenge in my opinion is transparency. So it requires the injection of Saika, right? How many of you are running startup or shutdown sequence issue with Saika today? Nobody? Somebody? Got to be somebody. There's actually a lot of uh, complaints we heard from our user in the Istio community, and I'm sure it's all across different service mesh projects too. And then how many of you are not too happy the sidecar upgrades that require restarting of your application? Yeah. That's right. <laughs> and uh, how many of you um, ever wanted to run jobs, Kubernetes jobs, but find out, all right, it doesn't really support jobs with the sidecar. Um, that was a little bit frustrating, right? And what if you have server sent first protocols, like MySQL, right? How many of you had requirements to run those in service mesh? Sorry, hopefully I didn't cause that. Yeah, so these are the challenges with, uh, with Saika, right? The, you always have to drag something with you, and then it has frequent needs with CVE upgrades. And uh, the second challenge I would say is incremental adoption, right? Most of users adopt service mesh because mutual TLS, but Saika doesn't offer a choice. They can just adopt service mesh just for a fraction of the Saika. Um, they still have to carry the entire Saika with their application container, even though they just need one single piece of the service mesh, which is typically mutual TLS. It's really all or nothing uh, model with the sidecar today. Uh, the, the third thing, in my opinion, with sidecar is over provision of resources. Let's say you have 10 uh, replicas for your services, and each of your 10 replicas always have the sidecar sits along with them, even though you may only need three pods to do the job your sidecar is doing, whether it's mutual TLS or traffic um, shifting or layer seven processing. So you don't have that choice and you have to always pay for that uh, cost of Saika. With that, I'm going to pass to Justin to talk about ambient service mesh. Yeah, so you know, with the plan with ambient was we wanted to address those issues that uh, Lynn was mentioning. So. Uh, sort of the most important one from at least my point of view was not being disruptive to the applications. So having the the proxy be a sidecar, uh, the way that those sidecars are instantiated, it requires restarting the application. So you can't just hot insert uh, service mesh into your workloads. You have to do something that's fairly disruptive. And because we're doing full, full L7 processing, there's also the chance that we can break some applications that have non-compliant HTTP stacks. Um, there is some stuff with the way that we do MTLS upgrade in Istio that could cause some breakage. And so we wanted to address those things. Um, and then also, just when there are, 
are C, um, CVEs that need to be addressed in the proxy, it requires, you know, if we want to upgrade, it requires uh, restarting the workloads as well. So we want it to be much less disruptive to applications. Uh, as Lynn mentioned, currently we have to, in Istio with sidecars, you have to over-provision for the proxies. You have to, for each workload, you need to have a proxy and allocate resources for worst case scenario for the traffic that is likely to be seen on that particular application, which means that, that you end up telling uh, Kubernetes that you need additional resources that you end up never using so that a lot of it just goes underutilized. Um, we also wanted to make sure, though, that you know, sidecars still have their place. Uh, there are a number of, of applications uh, that require the you know, kind of the security model or the approach that sidecars uh, have, and so we also wanted to make sure that whatever we did also continued to interoperate with sidecars. Uh, and um, as Lynn was mentioning, we also. Currently, the way that Istio would work is if you wanted just even a feature like MTLS, you had to take all of um, Istio in, all of the complexity. You needed sidecars, you needed to restart your applications. And we wanted to have a smooth path so that sort of the amount of work that you had to do was related to, uh, or to get it installed was related to the uh, complexity of what you wanted to do. So we wanted a smooth upgrade path from something relatively simple like MTLS encryption to full Istio. So here's a picture of uh, traditional sidecars. So you can see that we have five workloads here. Um, and then there, for each of the workloads, there is a sidecar proxy um, within the same pod. So what we wanted to do, or so the approach that we took with Ambient is that we broke apart the, the proxy into two parts. Um, and then we also are looking now at um, providing policies, L4 policies, separating L4 policies from L7 policies. So at the lowest layer, we have the L4 policies, which we call the secure overlay. And so instead of having the sidecars, we take the, the, the proxy um, that we're calling Z-Tunnel, and we run that as a daemon set on the node. So instead of having one proxy per workload, we have one proxy per uh, node. And then that Z-Tunnel is responsible for doing the um, MTLS connections between it and other Z-Tunnels. And when I talk about how L7 works between the, um, the Z-Tunnel and uh, a waypoint proxy. Now once we want to introduce L7, we still have the Z-Tunnels. Nothing changes in the workloads themselves. But now we introduce a, what we call a waypoint proxy. And that is a full... L7 uh, Envoy proxy that we're deploying that uh, does everything that you would normally expect um, Istio to do. And rather than make it an all or nothing, we configure it per namespace or per service account. So let's say that you had these S1 and S2 workloads that uh, you know, are in one network names, or in one, um, sorry, Istio namespace. Then if you had L7 policies for those, what we would do is we would spin up a waypoint proxy and then we would redirect any traffic um, that would, before, you know, in the previous drawing here, we saw that if C1 wanted to connect to S1, it would just go over that, um, that tunnel. But now uh, what we do is we tell any traffic that needs to reach that S1, it needs to go through the waypoint proxy and we redirect the traffic. And Lynn will get into a lot more of these details when she um, does the, the packet eye view. Um, of tra tracing the traffic. So as I mentioned, we've, we're now breaking uh, the Istio into sort of two different, um, you know, consciously choosing two different layers. So we have the secure overlay layer, which is just doing uh, L4 processing. And so in that case, we, don't, we can't actually do anything L7 related, but we can do any L4 policies could be done in, the, in that Z tunnel. And so there, you know, we can do TCP routing, um, TCP metrics, MTLS tunneling. Um, but if you want things like authorization policies on URIs, that requires the waypoint proxy, and then that gets deployed, and that's that L7 processing layer. Another thing that we introduced with Ambient is uh, something that we're calling HBone. So previously, when we did an MTLS connection in Istio, we had sort of a hacky method that we would use for um, upgrading every connection to MTLS that was sort of fragile and it could break some applications. And so 
we have defined this new uh, protocol that we're calling HBone. And it's really HTTP Connect um, uh, with just sort of standard headers within the HTTP um, header. And then we use MTLS for the encryption. Um, and so instead of, you know, previously, uh, if you used Istio and you wanted to encrypt the traffic, if we had these three connections on 80, 443, and 980, um, the, each one of those would be a separate connection to the proxy. Instead, what we're doing is we're opening a single um, HTTP uh, connection and then uh, tunneling all of the traffic through that, which makes, um, uh, which cleans up a lot of the, the issues that we were seeing with the previous method. Uh, it also makes it easier now when we have those waypoint proxies because we've defined a standard tunneling mechanism to carry some of that identity you know, as traffic has to go through that, you know, go out of its way and not just going from workload to workload. So one of the questions that we get, um, you know, the first question that people often ask about this is what the security model is, because obviously it looks a lot different from the sidecar, where the, before, you know, it was pretty easy to understand that the sidecar did everything and it's just sitting next to the workload. But now we have a shared re well, multiple shared resources. So I wanted to just briefly touch on this. We actually wrote a blog when we announced Ambient Mesh. It's available on the Istio website, if you're interested, that goes into a lot more detail about how security works. But there's sort of three different levels that I think of. So first is uh, the way that the application interacts uh, with the, the service mesh. And so it's actually an advantage now not to have the workload co-located with the, the, the proxy. So previously, if there was a vulnerability in the application, then that application could actually attack the proxy. Um, and also, you know, if the application was just misbehaving, the current way that we would send traffic through the proxy is we would just use IP tables rules and redirect the traffic. But it was pretty trivial for an application that is misbehaving to just bypass the proxy entirely. So by moving the enforcement outside of the workload, we actually have better protection than we previously had. Um, another one is the, the Z tunnels. And so obviously there is some concern that people have when they first hear about this design about having this Z tunnel have the certificates of all of the workloads. Um, but we try to mitigate, or we mitigate that in a couple different ways. Um, first of all, when the workload requests the certificate, um, or so it, uh, so sorry, when a workload starts up, the Z tunnel notices that, and then it requests from the CA for the certificate for that workload. Um, and then that CA actually ensures that that workload is available. It, it authenticates the Z tunnel, and then it makes sure that that workload that is being requested is actually present. Um, so that, you know, not a Z tunnel can't just ask for anybody's certificate. Um, the other thing is that the Z tunnel, I mentioned that is just doing L4 processing. So it has a much smaller attack surface than the full Envoy proxies that we were doing before as sidecars. Um, so, you know, when we look at the Envoy CVEs, most of them are related to the L7 processing that's happening, which we are not doing at all in the, um, in the Z tunnels. And then finally, there are the waypoint proxies, which are shared. But the way that they, we share them are per service account or per namespace. So those, um, those workloads already um, have a common identity. So really having uh, the waypoints shared um, doesn't, doesn't reduce the security at all um, because it's not really any different than the sidecar. And I'm going to pass it to, to Lynn to, to walk through the, the packets. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Justin. That was a great overview of uh, Istio Ambient Service Mesh. I'm really excited about the security stuff you were just talking about. So uh, a disclaimer, we don't have a live demo because we actually have multiple live demo on YouTube. So if anybody wants to see an ambient live demo, just go to the Istio channel. The packet walkthrough we're going to have uh, is going to focus on the pieces relevant to Istio. So I'm not going to dive into like Kubernetes networking and uh, you know how the container networking works just because we don't have enough time for the talk. Um, so as Justin was just mentioned, right, if you just need uh, mutual TLS or layer four uh, functionalities, uh, you basically only need a Z tunnel. So what happens in this case uh, is uh, the, so, uh, the client, which is app A in this diagram, so the app A would come over and, uh, you know, and then when it attempts to send the traffic, uh, request to app 
be, oh, what happens? <laughs> Sorry about that hiccup. Um, all right. Sorry about that. Uh, this is a single point of failure, so God bless. <laughs> so uh, when app A is attending to send a request to app B, uh, the Z tunnel, uh, we set up traffic redirection through IP table and routes. So the request would be captured by the Z tunnel that's co-located on the same node. And then the Z tunnel would uh, impersonate as app A and send the request through the Edgebone uh, tunnel that Justin was just mentioned, and then to the target uh, Z tunnel. And then the target Z tunnel is intelligent to forward the traffic to app B. So that's how it works at a high level. So let's take a dip into how it works. Um, so the first thing is you would need to include uh, your application in ambient service mesh, right? Else we don't know whether you want your ambient, uh, your, your application part of ambient. And to do that, uh, the simple way to do that is label on the namespace. So for anything you want to be part of is your ambient service mesh, you just simply label that namespace with uh, ambient. And that's how we know uh, you want to be part of ambient. So essentially in uh, Istio config map, there is an ambient mesh uh, configuration. By default, that configuration is namespace, but eventually, um, when you feel comfortable about ambient, you want to enable it for the entire mesh, you could enable it as for the entire cluster. So that's also available. But for now, let's do it on the namespace as people looking explore ambient and transition to ambient. So uh, another key component is Istio CNI. Uh, we have uh, expanded Istio CNI to work with ambient. So what it does is the Istio CNI would do a check to see if uh, the, uh, the application is part of ambient uh, based on the namespace label we just talked about. And if it's part of ambient, we are going to set up the uh, traffic redirection to have uh, the Z tunnel co-located with the application part to always capture all the incoming and outgoing traffic. It's kind of similar as the IP table setup with the sidecar and the application container today, except uh, we're doing it between the application pod and Z tunnel co-located on the same node. And if the pod is not, the app is not part of Ambient, we would essentially do nothing. So it would be behave the exact same as you are not part of uh, Istio or Ambient Service Mesh. So uh, let's walk through how Z Tunnel works. Um, before you even send any request from app A to app B, uh, the moment you stand up your pod uh, in that particular namespace that you labeled as Ambient, uh, Z Tunnel is going to serve as a uh, uh, XDS client, it's going to try to um, get uh, the application, uh, get, get the configuration from the Istio control plane. So essentially uh, what Z tunnel is going to send the request uh, to Istio control plane on 15012. And then the Istio control plane figure out, oh, you are the Z tunnel on that particular node, and this is your specific XDS config. Because if you are a Z tunnel on a different node, your configuration will look uh, differently. Now let's talk about as you add applications to your namespace that has this magic ambient label, uh, Z tunnel is also served as a certificate authority client. So in this case, uh, what Zitano is going to do is Zitano is going to say, hey, this is uh, my service account token for Zitano. Um, now this application A is, can you give me the search of the application A so that I can impersonate application A? So the Istio control plane is going to do the check that Justin was just mentioned, whether the 
um, the part for application A is co-located on the same uh, Z tunnel that's sending the request to see if it's allowed to represent application A and then send back to say if it's allowed, hey, you are allowed to represent application A and uh, here are your certs. So essentially a Z tunnel on the node is multi-tendency. It can represent um, application A or it could represent any other application that's part of ambient and co-located on the same node. Um, the next thing we want to talk through is how the traffic uh, redirects, right? So when the application does send a request to from application uh, A to application B on port 80 in this example, so the connectivity between application A to Z tunnel right now is actually plain text uh, in green. Uh, the reason why it's plain text is because uh, we don't encrypt that, uh, that traffic at the moment and uh, the Z tunnel uh, would upgrade the connection through uh, encrypted traffic through the edge phone once the traffic hits the Z tunnel. So uh, this is also what Justin mentioned earlier. It's very, very similar as how your application container works uh, with the sidecar next to it. It's also the plain text traffic. Um, so now at the moment, uh, the Z tunnel, we talk about it has the search for app A. It also have the right XDS configuration. So it can figure out, you know, where is the target? What is the target of the application B Z tunnel it needs to reach out to? So the next thing we're going to talk about is um, uh, on the source Z tunnel, what's going to happen when the package arrives on the source Z tunnel. Uh, so essentially the source Z tunnel is going to figure out what is the destination Z tunnel based on the XDS config. We just uh, talk about how it gets the XDS config. And then from there, it's going to try to figure out is there an existing edge phone Z uh, tunnel um, between application A and application B service account pair? It's trying to reach from this particular source and the targeted Z tunnel. If it is yes, let's go ahead, reuse the existing tunnel, right? Be more efficient. And then if there's no existing pair, it would create uh, the new tunnel. So uh, if you recall that Edgebone um, slide that Justin talked about, this is the uh, Edgebone tunnel and the logic trying to decide whether to reuse. Now, as the uh, as we think out where the destination is uh, and uh, think out whether to establish the edge bone uh, tunnel, as the package is reaching out to the destination Z tunnel, so by the way, this traffic is encrypted, it's uh, mutual TLS uh, because the source uh, Z tunnel needs to present the app A certificate and the destination Z tunnel using similar way, it uh, can impersonate application B, so it also serves as a XDS client and also CA client. So it gets uh, the app B search here and it also gets the right configuration. So now what happens uh, when the package arrives at the destination uh, Z tunnel, the first thing it does is to terminate the mutual TLS that uh, that traffic is terminated and then it's going to do a policy check. Remember Justin talked about you can do uh, layer four policies. So it's going to check if application A is allowed to call application B, right, on that particular port number. And if it's allowed, uh, yes, let's go ahead, forward the package to application B, and that will be plain text uh, forwarding. And if it's not allowed, it's going to drop the package. So it's not going to let the request go through. Um, Justin also talked about uh, Waypoint Proxy. One of the key innovation in Istio Ambient Service Mesh is uh, the two-layer approach, right? The layer four is multi-tenancy with Z tunnel, and optionally, you can add layer seven through Waypoint Proxy only if you need uh, that functionality. So 
in the case there is a waypoint proxy, for instance, you need uh, layer seven processing. Uh, so uh, the source zeta node, it would be programmed automatically by Istio control plane through the XDS um, client and configuration from Istio control plane. And then it would know to send the traffic to um, the, the waypoint proxy. So the waypoint proxy, uh, it's going to represent uh, service B uh, service account in this example. And the waypoint proxy uh, is also going to get uh, the application B search uh, from the Istio control plane. And the, the, the interesting thing here about waypoint proxy is it doesn't represent more than one uh, search is only represents the application B search, so it's going to go through the same car to its your control plane, which we talk about. And then uh, from there, the waypoint proxy is also having XDS config from the Istio control plane, so it knows uh, to forward the traffic uh, further to the destination Z tunnel uh, in the case of the waypoint proxy. All right, so that's how it works uh, in the basic scenario with uh, source and target Z tunnel and whether you have a waypoint proxy in, in for your layer seven processing. Uh, now let's talk about how sidecar works. Uh, in Istio 1.16 and master, um, it's recently just added uh, support for edge phone for sidecar. So shout out to John, did a lot of work on that in our audience. Um, so the purpose the reason why we put uh, edge phone support for sidecar is for interoperability, right? When you guys run sidecar uh, with 1.16 and then when you use Ambient, you can actually have them talk to each other. The reason is the Z tunnel speak edge phone and then the sidecar post uh, 116 or uh, newer can also speak about edge phone so the two can easily uh, interoperate, which is really, really cool. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about is what if uh, the source is in ambient and uh, the application D is outside of mesh. So in this case, uh, it's still control plane is going to be automatically program the source Z tunnel to recognize uh, the application, the destination is outside of the mesh and it's going to try to send the plain text traffic because that's the only traffic the application D could understand. And the other scenario is, what if uh, the, the source is, uh, I guess, is uh, outside of the mesh, right? The application E here, and the destination is application B is part of uh, ambient, and then it also have a waypoint proxy. Uh, in this case, right? So the way it works is the application E will send the traffic to application B and because of the traffic redirect set up by the CNI, it would always uh, capture the traffic on the destination Z tunnel and then the destination Z tunnel will do a high opening and uh, forward the traffic to the waypoint uh, proxy for application B if application B has a waypoint proxy. So uh, this would come through the edge bone in, uh, encapsulation and uh, it was it would be using the application B uh, search um, on both the Z tunnel and also the FB waypoint proxy. Uh, all right, I think that's all the scenario we have uh, for different package I views. Um, I guess I just want to quickly talk about the state of Istio Ambient Service Mesh at the moment. So it's an experimental branch in Istio. We're working really, really hard in the community to merge it to master. John actually started a list of things uh, that we need to finish before drive Ambient to, um, to master and people can start to run it in production. So give us a little bit more time. Uh, we do expect to be merging master is a very high priority in upstream. We actually have weekly meetings uh, with contributors from 
Google, Solo, and AWS Cloud, uh, Red Hat, and a couple of other companies participating in the meeting. So really, really excited about that. Uh, we're also looking at optimized Z-Tunnel. We had some challenges with config Z-Tunnel to be multi-tenancy with Envoy, because Envoy wasn't designed to be multi-tenancy. So we're looking at optimized Z-Tunnel. Uh, we're trying to standardize the API between the control plane and also the data plane and, uh, you know, be able to upgrade, allow you guys to upgrade from Sidecar today, whether you're running it in your production environment to uh, it's your ambient. And we highly recommend you all to get involved in the Istio Slack. They are, uh, I believe it's slack.istio.io. If not part of the member, register. There's an ambient channel, part of the Istio Slack and the weekly contributor meeting. Uh, with that, I would like to thank you all, and I would love to hear questions from the audience. All right, anyone have any questions? All right. I actually have two questions, if that's okay. So um, even though it's a layer four proxy, do you think it becomes a bottleneck for everything running on the node? And how do you scale it as the workloads are scaling up? And my second question is, uh, we talked about reduced operational overhead, but it seems that the overall net complexity of the system, would you say it's comparable to the sidecar approach? Or it's, you know, at the same order of magnitude, just delegated more to the node? Uh, for example, if we were trying to debug, would we have a harder time debugging or an easier time debugging? Sure. So um, first of all, on the, the Z-Tunnel, so Lynn had mentioned that we're looking at optimizing the Z-Tunnel. So currently the way it's implemented is we've taken Envoy and we've been we've modified it. We have to create a lot more tunnels than I think Envoy is usually set up for. And so the scale isn't great for that, but we are looking at a Rust implementation that's showing, looking quite promising. So even with like 20,000 uh, tunnels, we're seeing it use less memory than than Envoy. So we think that um, you know, there's work to be done, but we don't think that that scaling will actually be an issue in practice by the time we finish optimizing it. Um, and then the second question about the complexity, um, I would say you, you're right. I think it is a bit more complex than the than the previous model, but the the sidecar has its own set of complexities um, when when debugging them. Um, but we will have to come up with a different way of, um, of debugging. So we have to look at you know, introducing the new debugging tools to make it you know, easier to trace, for example, where packets are getting dropped, you know, if something's going on in the network, that sort of thing. So we do recognize it's something that we need to, to, to work on to, to make it deployable. Yeah, can I ask you, have you tried the Istio Ambient Service Mesh? Okay, well, the question you asked are really good, <laughs> which made me think you already tried it. Um, I, I mean, I totally agree with what Justin said. I would say the other thing uh, you want to also look at is the complexity with sidecar, right? Because uh, if you have unique container, if you have Kubernetes jobs, if you have service and protocol, you know, the transparency to the hurdle to get it working with sidecar, you know, you're actually paying a lot of complexity. And then ambient is, it's a baby at the moment, right? It's experimental. So um, give us time to work through the debuggability, you know, a lot of performance issue. Ambient is actually as performant as sidecar, even with its uh, experimental stage. So that's very impressive. Uh, how many years do we spend to uh, work on sidecar? Five plus years. And uh, ambient is just, uh, you know, six months plus. So, yeah. Great question. All right, there's another question. Hi there. That was a great talk. So I wanted to understand a little bit on the resiliency of the Z-tunnels, right? So how do you build the resiliency? Because what if the Z-tunnel has a failure, right? And say there can be multiple reasons for the failure. So how do you build the resiliency in such cases? Because I'm sure more and more usages come, the failures will keep coming as well, right? So, Yeah, I mean, I think that 
you know, one of the hopes is that the Z tunnel, the way that we're implementing it, will be much simpler than the, the sidecar proxies. So you're right. I mean, there is going to be that single point of failure. I mean, we have other examples of that also within, you know, within Kubernetes, within networking stacks. So it is something that we um, will need to look at. Um, but I think that the simplicity of what we're trying to do should make it a much more resilient system than it has been in the past. Yeah, I would add uh, the way to think about the Z tunnel is think about it as your CNI, right? What if your CNI is um, not running on the node, right? It's real, but it could happen, right? That's also, it's uh, really important when you design your application. Uh, you want to make sure it's higher availability across different nodes. So yeah, just think about it as a CNI, part of the infrastructure. Yeah. Hi, uh, just thinking about uh, layer seven, layer seven handling uh, in that extra envoy. Uh, is there already, or do you anticipate there being something to um, say, make sure that network hop stays within the zone, or any other optimizations that you anticipate? Yeah, that's a really good question. Yeah, we've actually heard a lot of people asking for that. Yeah, the, the way we implement it right now at the moment, uh, how you deploy a waypoint proxy, we haven't talked about that. So it's using the Kubernetes Gateway API. So you basically tell us you need a waypoint proxy for your application, and then we would automatically provision the waypoint proxy for you. The current API doesn't really allow you to optimize on the placement of of the waypoint, but that's something we're definitely looking into to allow you to placement it uh, nicely in a particular maybe zone or region that's uh, uh, co-located with your app or whatever you need. Um, yeah. With the persistent uh, H-bone connection, how does load balancing work? Are there multiple connections in endpoints or is it? or does traffic just always flow to a single destination service? Do you want to take that? Yeah, so the way that it um, so currently works is that there would be a new connection for each um, workload tuple. Um, and so right now, I think it just all, they all share a single HBone connection. Um, I imagine it wouldn't be that difficult to, to do some sort of, of load balancing. Um, for like Z tunnel to Z tunnel. Um, we are looking at the ability to scale the waypoint proxies, in which case there would be some sort of L4 load balancing. So, you know, if um, one of those namespaces was enabled, it had a number of, um, it needed a number of uh, waypoint proxies, then we would do the, the load balancing on the, on the, um, the, the client side. Thank you, this is a very interesting talk. Um, with moving traffic to you know, lower in the stack, have you had to make any concessions about surfacing metrics and observability? And uh, do you have plans to implement that you know, feature in the future if you have had to make concessions? Yeah, that's a great question. It's uh, something we're actively working on. I believe uh, layer seven telemetry is in place with the experimental branch. A couple of us actually tried it. So you can actually go to the permissive endpoint to get all, pretty much all the uh, Istio metrics, like the total request count, uh, the HTTP metrics, that that's all available today with Istio Ambient Service Mesh. Um, the layer four telemetry, it's been actively working on. You'll see on my team been doing a lot of work on that. It hasn't made to the branch yet. Uh, we also have Red Hat team uh, from Kayali who actually tried to put uh, Istio Ambient, the services in Ambient in the Kayali graph. And uh, they've been raising to us uh, uh, some of the missing metrics. So yeah, that's definitely an area we would look into next uh, to show it up, uh, the observability graph in different tools. Yeah, I, I will add one thing though, is, which is that um, in order to get the performance up, we try to drop one of the Envoy hops. So if, uh, for example, there, you know, previously you would have a sidecar on both sides of the connection. Now what we want to do is have just a sidecar, or not a sidecar, but we just want an Envoy proxy more on the server side to enforce policies. So that means some of the, the telemetry that you might get for like uh, request latency 
that might not be, that's not going to be available just because that is, you know, we're doing a different model. We do have some thoughts about how we might be able to, to, improve, to bring some of that back, but currently that's, that, that is missing. Okay, I have to apologize. We actually ran way over. It's 10:56 uh, because I'm the MC for the next session. So really, <laughs> apologies. I just uh, didn't keep track of time really well. So I would say thank you all for joining us for this session. I hope you guys enjoyed it and learned something. And uh, for folks who you ask good questions, come by and get your books here. So um, with that, uh, can I have the next speaker? come on to stage.